All right, so welcome again to our Bhakti Shastri and we're on the section chapter 7 to chapter 12. This is our second lesson, so we're still on chapter 7. Right? Anyone remembers anything from yesterday's class? Can remember anything? What did we talk about? Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. We learned about hearing. Hearing being very important. Six, the last 647 talked about hearing and leads to chapter 7. Yes, right. The emphasis was on hearing. Hearing from Lord Krishna. Right? Hearing from Lord Krishna, Krishna's representative. Hearing about Krishna and things in relation to Krishna. Very important. Thank you. Anyone else like to offer anything you remember? We discussed... Yes, Prabhu? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Krishna is the essence of everything. All right. Krishna is the essence of everything. Essence. Yes. And Krishna is the maintainer. He is the maintainer. Okay. And uh, Maharaj, details of para and aprasakti of Krishna. Details of para and aprasakti of Bhagavan Krishna. Okay. Details of para and apara prakriti. Yes. Lord Krishna's para and apara prakriti. Yes, Maharaj. Which one is para? Para is uh, living entities. Living entities. Living entities. Living entities. Superior. The superior energy, right? Energy. Right, then apara is inferior. Why is it inferior? No consciousness. She is separated, separate, no consciousness and separated energy of Krishna. Right. Yes. Okay, very good. So we'll go ahead. Let's see. <coughs> How to overcome the modes of material nature? Okay, so chapter 7. Is everyone seeing this slide okay? Hare Krishna, can everyone see the slide? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes Maharaj. Okay, good. Yes, Maharaj. So let's see. Good so let's see the objectives we have today. We see only the file name, Maharaj. You see only what? We the only file names. Files name. So it's a list of files. Oh. Except the file needs to be opened. You're not seeing the slide. No, 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 no. No. Oh, okay, I have to do it again. Let's see. You're seeing this, huh? No, I'm seeing this. Only this much. Now, can you see the slide? No, no Maharaj, not yet. That slide, slide has to be open. No, oh, I'm opening it, it's not. <laughs> Maharaj, do we have two screens by any chance? We have what? We have two monitors. Maybe the, the PowerPoint is opening on another monitor which is not on the Zoom. Yeah, what's happening here? Why am I not getting that? Okay. 
where is the slide? Hmm? Where are the slides? Yeah. Here. Now you can see it? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. Thank you, Prima. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll see the objectives. We're going to look at uh, the different surrenders those people who surrender and don't surrender to Krishna. And we want to be able to identify these people from contemporary society. We want to recognize the different types of people who surrender and don't surrender on the basis of contemporary society. We see a lot of people in the world today, some surrender, but many don't. And then we want to also think about Lord Nityananda Prabhu's mood of delivering the Naradamas and how that reflects Prabhupada's mood. We'll talk about the Naradamas in a short time. We want to explain how Krishna is covered by the internal potency. According to the Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 7, verse 25, Krishna is covered by the internal potency and then the importance of punya karmanam as a prerequisite for practice of Krishna bhakti, the reference to verse number 28, verse and purport. And finally, we should have an overview of chapter 7 identifying significant sections, the links between them. All right, so we have a lot to do tonight. So yesterday we talked about these different items. This is overview of what we covered so far. Knowing Krishna in full by hearing about Him. Knowing Krishna's energies and his position in relation to those energies, right? We spoke about the importance of hearing, we spoke of, you also mentioned here about para and apara, Krishna's energies, Krishna's position in relation to these energies, that he is absolute. And he has these inconceivable potencies. And then, Knowing Krishna through his impersonal features, where he, one devotee was saying how Krishna is everything, his impersonal feature, the sound in ether, the taste in water, ability in man, they're all different features of Krishna. These are his impersonal features. So we can know Krishna through so many different aspects in the phenomenal world. But Krishna and everything is under the control of the modes of nature, but Krishna himself is not. Krishna is the controller of the modes of nature. Krishna is not under the modes of nature. The three modes are controlled by Krishna. Therefore surrender. So that's what we're going to speak about now. We we discussed about the importance of surrendering to Krishna, right? We spoke about surrendering to Krishna, how it's very difficult to surrender to Krishna, very difficult to get free of maya. That was the point. It's very difficult to overcome maya, but if we surrender to Krishna, then we can cross over Maya. 
So Krishna himself is not under the control of the material nature. He controls the material nature, but we are under the control of the material nature. But if we surrender to Krishna, we can easily cross beyond the material nature. So why doesn't everyone surrender? What's the problem? Why is everyone not surrendering? They don't have faith. They don't have faith? Okay. Ignorance. Ignorant, yeah. There are actually four classes of people, right, who don't surrender to Krishna. Described in the Bhagavad Gita, Namam Duskritinho Mudha. Namam Dus, they're all Duskritinas, right? Duskritina meaning? What does it mean? Duskritina? Miscreants. Miscreants, yes. They, they have no piety. No piety. They have no piety. They have, they have no sukriti. They're duskritinas. And so they have no piety. And so there are four different classes of people in, in this category who never surrendered to Krishna. First one was the mudha. Mm -hmm. Mudha, meaning like what? Foolish. Mudha means? Ignorant? Yeah, but actually we usually, we say donkey, like a donkey. Mudha, they're like donkeys. Why are they like donkeys? What's it, what are they doing? They work hard in anticipation of material pleasure. Get food. Yes, right. They're like donkeys working hard. Why are they working? They say, if I don't work, I won't be able to eat. Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, well, the donkey, the donkey, he thinks like that. He thinks if I don't carry the heavy load, I won't get any grass to eat. But grass is growing everywhere. Yeah. And so the donkey doesn't need to carry the load, but he's so mm -hmm. foolish, he thinks, I have to carry the load in order to get my grass to eat. The grass is everywhere, he doesn't need to carry that load. So in the same way people are thinking, I have to work, if I don't work I won't get food, I won't be able to eat. And we tell people, well you can come and take prasadam at the temple, and come and chant and dance and take prasadam. But people, oh, I have to work, I have no time, like that. So this is a mudha, working all day, all night, to feed the belly. So they, they, it's for, because they're working like that, they don't surrender to Krishna. They say, I have no time, I can't surrender to Krishna, I have no time. And then the second class of man, Nara Dhamma, right? There's Nara Tama and Nara Dhamma. Nara Tam means the best of men. And Nara Dhamma means lowest of men, the lowest of mankind. Why? Why they're, in, why they're Nara Dhammas? because they have the opportunity to become Krishna conscious, but they won't take it. They may be born in a good family, they have a good upbringing, good education, good culture, but they don't take advantage to become Krishna conscious. Therefore, they're described Nara Dhamma, the lowest of men. And so, we were saying, Lord Nityananda, Nityananda, he was, you know, the, with Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, they were, they preached the Krishna Consciousness Movement 500 years ago. They pioneered the Sankirtan Movement. We say, 
Lord Chaitanya is Krishna and Nityananda is Balaram. So Lord Nityananda, he was preaching Krishna consciousness and he would go to all the most unqualified people and he would request them to chant the holy name of Krishna. He would go and fall at their feet and he would tell them, read the books about Krishna, worship Krishna and chant the name of Krishna. So he was a big, powerful person, very tall and very powerful built and he would come and he would fall at their feet and he would beg them, please, you chant the holy name of Lord Krishna. <coughs> So this was the mood of this was the mood of Lord Nityananda and Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada exemplified that mood. Can you understand why? What did Prabhupada do that was similar to the mood of Lord Nityananda? She went to the Western World Massage. Yes. Right. And he also preached to the hippies. Yes, he preached to the people who were, you know, like, they were like Naradamas. They were the lowest people. They were the, the you know, the, the bottom of the society. They were all like culture, they were like rejects from the society. They were not really sophisticated or cultured or anything but Prabhupada went there and he distributed the mercy of Krishna. He brought Krishna consciousness to them. So that was the mood of Lord Nityananda. He would go <laughs> without considering who's qualified and who's not. He would go to the areas where people were seemingly the most unqualified, the most uh, degraded. And even Prabhupada went, first of all, he went to the West, which in itself was degraded. But when he was in the West, he began preaching in New York, in the city, where people were really fallen. And there were so many... Uh, people living in the streets and people without jobs and who were dropouts from society and Prabhupada was living amongst them and distributing Krishna consciousness. So that's the mercy, that's like the mercy of Lord Nityananda. <coughs> so there are, there are four kinds of people who never surrender. You have the mudha, people like a donkey. You have the Nara Dhamma, the lowest of men. Then you have the Maya Aparita Jnana, means one whose knowledge is stolen by illusion. One whose knowledge is stolen by illusion. These people, they want to understand the scriptures by their own speculation. They don't try to understand the scriptures based on the commentaries of the Acharyas. But they like to speculate on everything themselves and try to explain it in their own way without hearing the message of the disciplic succession. <laughs> so this is Maya Aparita Jnana. And then Asuram Bhavam Ashrita. We have those people who are like demons, atheists, blasphemers, offenders, these kind of people. They say there's no God, they say this religion is all bogus, nonsense, sentimental, you people are all cheaters, like that, these kind of people. So these are four classes of people who don't surrender to Krishna. And then you have four classes of people who do surrender. After describing the four kinds of people who don't surrender, then Lord Krishna goes on to describe the four kinds of people who do surrender. And 
unlike the four kinds of people who don't surrender, they don't surrender, they didn't surrender, they're duskritinas. But the four kinds of people who surrender to Krishna, they have sukriti, they have some piety. That's why they've come to Krishna. Chatur, um, Chatur Vijja Bajantimam Jnana Sukritino Arjuna Arto Jignasur Artarti Jnani Cha Bharatarshaba. So for Krishna gives four reasons why people would surrender to him initially. He says, first of all, distress. And actually that's the most common in this world, particularly in the modern society, in the Kali Yuga, many people are in distress. They're in distress. They're maybe lonely people, they're living in fear, they have so, so much anxiety, so much stress. And they're in, so they're in distress for one reason or another. But if, they're, if they have some sukriti, they will come to Krishna consciousness. If they don't have sukriti, what will happen to them? Where will they go? They're in distress, right? What are they going to do? In their life, make suicide. Oh, that would be very extreme. Yeah, possible. Anything else they might do? Yes, right. Yes, that's a common thing, isn't it? People who have no sukriti, they take shelter of drugs or alcohol or something like that. Yes. But the pious people, they will come to Krishna. So, arto jignasu and arta jignasu means inquisitive. Inquisitive. They want. They, they, they want to understand why am I suffering. They want to know what is this and what's the solution to all my problems. And they they come to Krishna consciousness. They have many questions. They want to understand more. What are you people doing? And why do you? Why do you all chant Hare Krishna and like this? So inquisitiveness, that's a, another reason which will bring people to Krishna consciousness. And then artarti, people who want some kind of wealth. People who want some kind of wealth, they want to have some kind of uh, uh, greed to get something. So they, come to, they may come to Krishna to satisfy their desires. Example of somebody who had desire to get wealth was Dhruva Maharaj. Dhruva Maharaj wanted a kingdom and he went to find God in order to help him to get the kingdom. He went into the forest to f look for God. Who was the example of a person in distress who surrendered to Krishna? Gajendra Maharaj. Yes, Gajendra. They give the example about Gajendra the elephant was in great distress, he surrendered to Krishna. Dhruva Maharaj was in search of wealth. And who, were, who, were the, who was curious? Tanaka Rishi, like uh, those people, uh, saints in the... Uh, Yes, uh, right. Yes, the sages in Naimasharanya, they were curious. So, arto jignasur artarti jnani cha baritarshaba. And one more, those who are desiring knowledge. And the example is? Shukdev Goswami. The four Kumaras. The four Kumaras, they were looking for knowledge, desiring knowledge to get liberation initially. So, four kinds of people who surrender to Krishna, they're pious people, right? Uh, we have a little exercise for, for you. We want you to do a little exercise on this. We need some volunteers, right? Wait, role-playing. We're going to do 
We want, we want, we want eight volunteers, right? And we, four will be pious and four will be impious. And the other students, we, we will have to, uh, these eight people, they will be book distributors. Oh no, the other students will be book distributors. Okay, so we want eight people, they'll be the customers, and we'll have some of the other devotees will be the book distributors. And we will approach you to purchase books, or to take one of the books, and we have to identify which of the, which category the person is. Is he pious or impious? And what particular kind of piety or impiety does he have, right? So we need eight people, first of all, to be the customers. Right? Have we got... Um, right? Let's... Right? You have to... Uh, how are we going to do this? It's a bit tricky on the... On the Anyway, all right, anyway, you, you, Prabhu, you decide yourself which one of the, whether you want to be a pious or impious person and which particular type of person you're going to portray. And we're going to approach you to purchase a book or to take a book. All right? Who was a volunteer? Ramanish, Ramanish Prabhu. Ramanish Prabhu, yes. Uh, Shri Devi Gaurangi Mataji. Uh -huh. Gop Gopinath Prabhu. Uh -huh. Yogini Yamuna Mataji. So can we put four of them in one room and then four, another four in... Uh, no, you have to put all eight in the one room. We need okay. eight people. And then they'll decide for themselves. They have to decide which particular person they're going to play because we don't want people being the same. Okay. Yeah? So only these are eight people, right Maharaj? Yeah, just put eight people in a room. Okay. And just, and you, you have just two minutes to decide which person you're going to play and come right back and then we'll come and approach you to get a book. Okay, and have we got any book distributors here? Have you all done book distribution? No, not yet. No? Oh, okay, so you're going to get an opportunity tonight. Yes. You have to approach yes, one, you have yes, to you have to approach one of these eight people. Yes. You have to approach one one of them and offer them a book. Right? Yes. And we'll see how they respond. Yes, So what book are you going to distribute? Bhagavad Gita. Okay, very good, yes. Bhagavad Gita, distribute the Bhagavad Gita. So how are you going to introduce it? I'm going to say that, please read this book. It is about the Supreme 
personality or Godhead, the, the the Bhagwan, and you will like it. Mm. <laughs> okay. Have Have they come back from the room yet? Okay, okay you have to close the room. Get them back. They're taking too long. Okay, okay, Mahaj. All right, are they back? In 30 seconds, Maharaj, they will be back. Okay. Two participants have raised their hands. Some question? Yes, Naratam. Naratam Damodar Das Prabhu? Yes, yes Maharaj, can you pronounce Maharaj? Yes. So, uh, uh, I, I, I feel that uh, I, uh, I am an impious, impious person and I would like to purchase books for increasing my knowledge and so that I can develop my love for God, Godhead. Oh. But we're supposed to come and offer you the book, right? Yes, Maharaj. Oh, you're not one of the eight, I see. Are you? No? No, Maharaj. We're, we're selling the books. We're not... You're yeah. supposed... Namaz, I am distributing the books and uh, I am trying to convince uh, that why the uh, persons before me or the customer purchase this book, uh, written by Sita Prabhupada or other uh, such books. So I am distributing Prabhupada's book. So I am convincing the value of this book and how, what, it, what are the importance of this book and the teachings of the, these books. And why they should purchase. Okay, okay. Please just wait. All right, we have eight people, right? Yes, Maharaj, they're back. Okay, so the first one, Anka, is it? Yes, Maharaj, Ankur. All right, who's going to sell them the book? Someone approach him, offer him the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhu, who was doing that before? C can we turn off that chanting box, please? Right, who's going to distribute the book? can raise hand. We want okay, one huh? one person. All right, Ar Arun Arun Bai. Huh? Arun Balaji. Arun Balaji. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna So approach the uh, approach this one man. Offer him the book. Yeah, uh, I I thought to approach uh, Artarti. They are uh, yeah, mm -hmm. book distribution is the essence of our mission. Hare Krishna, Renat Pranam. Uh, I'm from uh, ISKCON representing uh, uh, 
Madhra Desh, and we are uh, distributing books uh, of uh, Srila Prabhupada, which is. We got the ones from that Hare Krishna Maliva. Yes, yes, Baba. <coughs> okay, so, Bataye, how can I help you? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it could be a great help if you get one book of our uh, Srila Prabhupada, because uh, the book distribution is our mission in preaching Krishna consciousness all through the world. Also, no, but I see you are I see you are creating this big temple there, so you might be getting a lot of money from there. So why are you selling the book? See, man, there is no God in the world. What so, are you doing after? Why are you wasting your time after uh, who does not exist? Yeah, uh, we are building temples out of this uh, because uh, the temples are only for the soul. We are concentrating on the soul activator. We are not uh, uh, concentrating on any material uh, things. If we are concentrating on the soul, then certainly the purification process will be done if we build it temples. So that is why ISKCON is always uh, focusing on temple constructions. Look, so, look man, this soul, this soul is just, you know, all these are theories. So don't tell me all these theories. I'm sure that you might have written all these theories in this book also. So why should I waste my time in studying and... Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, very good, enough. So what kind of person is he displaying? What kind of person is this person, the, the one who, is tra who doesn't want to buy the book? What does he represent? Atheist, Maharaj. Atheist. Atheist. Atheist, huh? Atheist. 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 Is that right? Maya, Pahita, Gyan. Number four. Asuram. 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 Asuram Bhavamakritaha. Is that right, Prabhu? Is, is that yes, right? Yes, Prabhu. Yes? That, oh. is, that is what I was, I was trying to. Very good. Okay, very good. Thank you. Let's have somebody else come up. Hare Krishna. Thank you. And who's going to distribute the book? Thank you, ma'am. And try. And try, Prabhu. Let's yeah, have a book distributor. Yeah, I can, I can become Prabhu Artho. Uh, okay, then Dhananjay, Dhananjay Prabhu, can you become a volunteer? Yes, Prabhu, yeah, but here for, for, accept, uh, uh, for... Kindly, kindly do not disclose, uh, I would request uh, what I could understand, uh, all the devotees. Kindly do not disclose uh, what you have become. Uh, others have to identify what you have become. Yeah, identify. Uh, so kindly don't disclose. All right, go ahead. Present the book. Devotee can raise hand. Who wants to distribute? Let's have a Mataji, book distributor. Yes, if, if, when you read Bhagavad Gita, you will find the answer. 
All right, what kind of person is this? Distressed. Is that right, Prabhu? Yes, Prabhu, yeah. Yes, yes. you're one in distress, yes. eh? Okay. Yeah, distressed. Very good. Well done. Thank you. Let's have the next person. Hare Krishna. Yes. We need somebody to approach. Who's going to sell the book? Who's giving the book? Can I do that? Yes, you don't need to say much, just give the book. Yeah. Hare Krishna Mataji, we have some wonderful things to offer you. This is the, uh, this is in the form of book, what the, the Lord has stated. So th this can solve all your problems. So pre please take this book and get uh, uh, solutions to all your problems. Uh, see, uh, see Prabhu, I have to work more and then I have to earn. In this book, how I can get a money, how I can give, feed my family and all. What is this you are telling? If you are giving the book and then all the problems will be solved, all the problems will solve in one book? Mataji, you, you, you keep on working, working and one day life will come to end. And do you think what is going to happen after you leave this body? So you, 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 you are working from since morning uh, uh, and you keep on working for the whole life. But ultimately, you have you thought of what is going to happen after uh, this life. So this, this book will help you uh, to solve the uh, uh, real problem of life. Uh, uh, so please uh, uh, take this book, read through it, and this will solve all your problem what you are facing right now. I don't have time, Prabhu. I'm working uh, 16 hours a day. I don't have time to spend for my family also. Then how can I take a time to read this book and all? Okay, okay. So who knows what she represents? Muda, Muda. Muda, Muda. Muda, yes. Muda. I think so, yes. Muda. Okay, good Muda, yes. <laughs> okay, next one. I can, I can be a customer manager. Okay. Hare Krishna, so I would approach uh, Ramnish Prabhu. Uh, Hare Krishna, good evening. Uh, see, I have, uh, you know, a wonderful book for you. Uh, you seem to be a student and this is, you know, a wonderful book for a student. This is Bhagavad Gita, you know, it is the most read book in the entire world. And you might have heard, definitely have heard about International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So this Bhagavad Gita is written by the founder Acharya of uh, International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have heard you people are very rich. Uh, yeah, we are rich because uh, you know we, because we are under the shelter of the richest man of the entire universe, the supreme personality of Godhead. You can also become rich if you uh, read and you follow the instructions why, given why, in the book. Why your temple has so many? You know, I see so many uh, this. Uh, uh, so in beautiful temples, marble temple you build. Why you need to build so many big temples and you have to have so you conduct so no, many donations? The, yeah, so see the entire universe is owned by the supreme personality of God and Krishna. So we must offer, we must construct very magnificent temples for you. You should love to him and we should share everything with each other. We should do charity for the poor people. You take yeah, we collect do. so much money and do big big festivals. Yeah, you are absolutely right. We, you are absolutely right. Yes, we, we do have hospitals, we do have big temples, we do have big temples where you know, a lot of workers work and they get their employment. So if you look at our temples, what do you find? You find that, you know, there are big temples, a lot of people get employment there, uh, you know, a lot of people get food. We distribute food throughout the world. That is what you, uh, you people are like there, There's nothing such as God. Can you show okay, me so, God? Can you show me the okay, God? I can show you everything. I can show you everything. You have, see, you have got very wonderful question. I appreciate your questions. You know, what you just need to do is, you get all the answers in this book. Every, everyone same yes. If you go to every religious people, they say same thing. And all the fight in this world is because of you religious people. If you go from east to west, everywhere, the fight is because of the religious people. There's no yeah, reason to God. That is right. You are absolutely right. 
You have got what say? See, I can so much money. I can understand that. See, the temples have so much jewelry and everything. You never use it for the mankind. You just collect it. No, we use it. That is right. See, if you if you see your understanding, prima facie, your understanding is very good. That it seems that religious people are fighting. But when you read this book, you will realize that this book asks, requests people to you know rise above being Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, and Isai. We do not propagate to become a Hindu or to become a Muslim. So it helps everyone to rise above. You see, the Iskon is in the entire world. And okay, okay. You don't need to talk so much. We have to hear from the other person. So we are waiting for you to manage. Yeah. Okay. So then, anybody know who what he represents? He is an atheist. We already had an atheist. He couldn't be another atheist. We already had one atheist. You have plenty of atheists, Prabhu Maharaj. <laughs> you know some of mankind. I can be another customer. I can be the next customer, Guru Maharaj. Yes, okay. Uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I believe uh, you read lots of books. We have a very good book to read. Actually, it is like a complete encyclopedia. You know, I understand from you like you have lots of problems. Like in this world, everyone is having one or other problem. This book is complete encyclopedia, which you know, uh, whatever the problems you have, you have the solution in this book. I actually, I I'm now I'm in New York now. I studied in Yale. With a couple of friends, we decided to quit our studies. Actually, we come from a very rich families. We all come from very rich families. We're so happy to live together. You know, we really have freedom. Our parents were respectful. Our movements. You know, you're right. My father has a large library. Very nice life. I'm so happy. My friends here. Yeah. But still, but still, Mataji, you have lots of friends. But you should understand what is your aim of your life. Do you know that? Have you think about that once in a while or once in your lifetime? You have the complete answer. Are, you have the complete are, solution. No, no. When we are together with our friends, you know, we exchange uh, like LSD and cigarettes and things like that. You know, you think people feel bothered by anything. We're just living a very happy life, you know. We just have got each other, and then uh, when we're hungry, we'll try to look for some food. Otherwise, we're all right. And if we are fortunate, somebody will give us money. Then we will buy our our drugs and our food. But we'll Mataji, but Mataji, have you thought at the end of the day, are you happy? You are distressed, right, Mataji? One or the other way. Okay. But you can you can understand the complete happiness after reading this book. Uh, what does she represent? What? Uh, Maharaji, she represents Naradama, lowest among mankind. Naradama. Yeah, the Naradama, right? I think that's right. Yeah. Lowest of mankind. Yes. Okay. Next, next customer, I would like to eat Maharaji. Okay. So we have a nice book here for you. Why don't you take it home and read it? Yeah, yeah but uh, uh, this book, what I heard about this talks all about Krishna. I, I, I am believing in God. I uh, follow this Ashtang Yoga, but here I find a, a elderly person, son of a, 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 a cowherd man and uh, stealing and doing all these nasty things in the, over here. How we can believe that this can be a God? There is no God. I believe that God is absolute and he is far above and we have to, we can only achieve it through, through, through um, Ashtang Yoga, which is I'm practicing. So I don't believe that this is such a uh, uh, village boy uh, playing, uh, doing all uh, naughty things, he can be a god. Okay, so what does he represent? Person is searching for the knowledge of the absolute, Maharaj. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it Maya Aparita Jnana, knowledge stolen by illusion? 
I think so, yeah. I thought that. Is that right, Prabhu? Were you representing that? Yes, yes, Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj. Knowledge stolen by illusion. Maya Aparita Jnana. Okay, very good. That's enough. I think we'll stop here. We have to go ahead. Okay, you get the idea? Four kinds of pious people, four impious people. We're going to go ahead. Next, next question. Also group work. Drop a chart. Means, means write down reasons for turning towards Krishna and the reasons why we may distance ourselves. Also possibly explore whether our desires have been fulfilled. Have our motives changed over time? That might take a little more time than what we have tonight. I think we'll just have to leave that question for ourselves just now. It's, it's a bit more subjective, esoteric, it's not really suitable for us tonight. Let's go ahead. Okay, so we're going to hear about the demigods, the next section, four kinds of people. Well, first of all, we didn't really finish that section, let me conclude it for you, because that section was describing the four kinds of people who surrender to Krishna, right? We had four, uh, four kinds of people who don't and the four kinds of people who do. And which one is the best of the four who surrender? Which ones are the best? Jnani. Jnani. Jnani Maharaj. Jnani knowledge, absolute knowledge. Yeah, can the, can the other three, can they go back to Godhead? After a very long, long, long time. Yes. <laughs> By the gradual process of elevation, they might also reach the level of devotional service, Prabhupada Maharaj. What do they have to do before they can go back to Godhead? They have to give up their material desire. They have an attachment, right? They have some material desire. Right? They, they want something. Those people who in distress, the people, the person who wants some material wealth, like the Arta Arti. The Arto, Arta and the Arta Arti, they, they want something. And then the Jignasu, he's curious. You know, sometimes you get people come, they're very curious. And after a while they don't come anymore. And then you meet them again and you say, what happened? Why are you not coming? They say, well, I, I don't have any more questions anymore. <laughs> you know? And sometimes people come in distress and after their distress is gone, they go away. And they think, oh, no, my distress is over, I'm, I'm going now. And then you get people, they come, they have no job, they have no money, and they become a devotee. And there was this one devotee, he, was, he, he became a devotee, he was out distributing books, and he met someone and the man offered him a job. He said, you come and work for me, I'll give you a job. So he left, he stopped distributing books, and he went to work for some karmi man. <laughs> you know? So he gave up Krishna consciousness because he just had some material desire. But if one becomes fixed, if, if, if we become actually in Krishna consciousness, well, we have to come to the level of jnani. The people who, have desire, who are in distress, who are, and even the person who is curious, who has material desire, they are all Sakama devotees. They're devotees, they are devotees, they are devotees, but they have material desires, right? They're called karma misra bhaktas. So they can't go back to Godhead until they become jnanis. They have to come to, they have to become, actually first they should become jignasu. The, the jignasu, the curious person, is in between the person in distress and the person with material desire for wealth. So the per they should, they will come to that position where they become curious about Krishna. 
And then from that position, then they'll go on, they have to go on and become a jnani before they can go back to Godhead. So they have to, they have to get rid of their material desires. Materi if they still have material desires, they can't go back to Godhead. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yes. Can I, can I please ask the question? How oh. about a, a person who practices Krishna consciousness for some time, but after I, I feel that the person wants to distance himself from uh, uh, what you call um, uh, Hare Krishna groups, uh, don't want to come for Zoom, any Zoom classes, not interested to listen to Zoom classes. The person says that the person wants to have solitude, uh, be on his own, uh, peace of mind. Uh, collect his thoughts and then uh, after one and a half years or two years later uh, he, will, he, uh, he will come back. He wants to be left alone and uh, relinquish some positions that you hold, some positions of responsibility. Which category does this devotee belong to Guru Maharaj? Thank you. Well, he's not really a surrendered devotee. We have to see if he's still chanting or not. Is he still going to keep chanting? Is he still going to follow the principles of Krishna consciousness and keep chanting? If he does that, then, you know, he's still surrendered. He, 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 but still he has a desire to be alone. That's, that in itself is not a good thing for Krishna Consciousness. To progress in Krishna Consciousness, you won't do it if you want to be on your own. So, he, you know, he has a desire, you could say he has a desire for peace. And so it's Karma Mishra Bhakti. I would, put a, I would put him on that level, Karma Mishra Bhakti. Sakama Karma Mishra Bhakti, not Niskam Karma Mishra Bhakti, but Sakama. He has material desires. The material desire, just to be alone. You cannot advance, you cannot progress just by being on your own. Right? Hare Krishna Maharaj? Yes? Uh, Maharaj, some devotees get uh, very sad to uh, mingle with the devotees if they do any upper something like that. They will get scared. What type of uh, devotees they are, Mahana? They're they're scared to do some offense. Can yes, yeah. When they mingle with the devotees, something like that, they will scared to mingle with the devotees. They are scared about the offensive and things and all. <laughs> yeah, but you you can't just use that for an excuse to stay away from devotees. You, somebody may say like that, that, oh, I'm afraid I offend the devotees, so I just want to stay away from devotees. No, that's not good. We have to learn to be with devotees. It's very important for us. Association with devotees is one of the important principles of devotional service. So somebody may say, I'm afraid of offending. That's just an excuse to be away from the devotees. No, we should learn to be with the devotees. You don't have to, of course, we don't want to offend them. But how do we, how do we avoid offending them? Well, just become their servant, just serve them. Or appreciate them, or praise them. But don't stay away from them. So people have all of these things, all these reasons, oh, I'm afraid I offend the devotees, so I stay away from the devotees. No, no. It's not acceptable. You have to be with devotees. And you have to hear. You, somebody was saying, you were saying, somebody says they, they didn't want to hear Zoom classes. They don't want to hear. They just want to hear their own mind. That's the problem. They're on the mental platform. They're on the bodily platform. They're not surrendering. Yes? Is it clear? Yes, Guru Maharaj, thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. 
Thank you, Maharaj. All right. Thank so, you, Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, you know, there are some people who visit the temple. They are attracted by the deities. And then they started coming to the temple and they do services. They become devotees. So which category they fall under out of these four? If some people just take up the devotional service like that. Well, they're coming to Krishna consciousness. They take up devotional service. You, you have to inquire from them about what brought them to come to the temple. You know, maybe simply their own piety, their piety brought them. Uh, you could say curious. Maybe they were just curious to come and see the temple. So Jignasu, right? They, they, didn't have, they didn't really have any material desire, but they were curious. They wanted to see what's going on in the temple. So they came, they saw the deities, and then they, they, they took up service, they accepted some service. And so, jignasu, curiosity. They still, they still have some, you know, some, some material desire, just curious, to satisfy their mind. They have to, they have to come to the platform of jnani. But remember, we will see here, Krishna describes which of the four kinds of people is the best. Now, Krishna describes this person who is the best. He said, the one who is in full knowledge, text number 17, one who is in full knowledge, who is always engaged in pure devotional service is the best. So, it's not just simply trying to get knowledge for liberation, but he's actually become a devotee. Which one is the best? is the one who's become the devotee and he's in full knowledge. So that he is the best. Hmm. So Maharaj, then the devotees, uh, uh, the, what I'm trying to understand is, are there any kinds of devotees who do not fit into these four categories? Because there are some people, they just come and take up devotional service very quickly, but they don't fall under any of these four categories. So is that possible that they are only one of, they will fit into one of these? No, they must be some. You, they must belong to some one of these categories. Yes. Oh. Unless they were, you know, maybe in their past life they were a great devotee, and so they've come immediately to Krishna consciousness. They have no material desires, and they just immediately they take up chanting and full devotional service. You know, very rare that somebody was a, already a devotee in their previous life, and they've come back to Krishna Consciousness. Not usually, not very common. Right? Thank you. Alright, so who is the best? The one who is in knowledge and who is always in pure devotional service is the best. And why? Krishna says, because I am very dear to him and he is dear to me. In other words, his purpose is not just simply gyan to get liberation, but he really wants to actually be a devotee. He's really a devotee. He's engaged in devotional service. So Krishna is saying, this person is the best. He has no material desire. The other three, they still have some material desire. So is there any hope for the other three? Or are they all useless? Yeah, they still have hope, Maharaj. As long as they are continuing the devotional service, Right. Text, text 18 goes on, Krishna describes in text 18, all of these devotees are undoubtedly magnanimous souls, but he who is situated in knowledge of me, I consider to be just like my own self. Being engaged in my transcendental service, he is sure to attain me, the highest and most perfect goal. So again, Krishna is confirming that the one who has become the devotee, who has come to that platform of jnani with devotion, he is the best. He is a jnani with pure devotion. He is the best. But they are all good souls. The others are also good. And in course of time, as you were saying, they will also become purified. But they have to... They have to give up their material desires. They, they will gradually realize that these material desires are insignificant. Just like Gajendra, 
and Dhruva Maharaj, you know, they both had material desires, but when the Lord came, then they, they didn't want any more. They didn't care anymore. They didn't want that. Gajendra didn't want any more when, when the Lord came and saved him. He said, why you saved me? You could have killed, he said, you killed the crocodile. You should have killed me. <laughs> he said, I could have been liberated. He said, I still have this elephant body. And Dhruva Maharaj also said, he said, uh, I was looking for bits of glass, but I found a beautiful jewel. So, so they realized the futility, they realized they're wasting their time with the material desires. And then Krishna also describes how long does it take for the jnani to come to that level of devotion? Is it quick? It's very, very long time. Yeah, it takes a long time. The process, by the process of knowledge like that takes a long time. It's not the quick process. We go, the, we take the lift. We go right up to the top of the building the quick way. We take the lift. If you go like this, the path of knowledge, many births and deaths. So it's, it, it's rare. Such a soul is very rare. So we can understand like that. This is rare. So anyway, these people surrendered. And so they made... They're pious people, they've come to Krishna consciousness. But they have to become nishkama, they have to come without material desires. And then, then they go on to fully surrender. Right? Okay, we'll go ahead. So, after that, we describe the four kinds of people who surrender and four who don't. But there are other people, they surrender, they surrender not to Krishna, but they surrender to the demigods, right? So that's described text number 20. And we're going to see here, we have also here in this section here. Um, here we are, the demigods. Someone can read for me. Hi Krishna. Let's Con concerning Ganesha worship, it is not actually necessary for us. But if someone has a sentiment for getting the blessings of Ganesha in order to get large amounts of money for Krishna's service, then it is all right. But anyone who takes up this kind of worship must send me at at least a one lakh dollars monthly, not less. If he cannot send this amount, then he cannot do Ganesha worship. Letter to Bhakta Dasa, first February 1975 from Honolulu. Mm -hmm. All right. So Prabhupada had that requirement. You want to worship Ganesh? You have to give him one lakh dollars every month. <laughs> It would be a big help to build the temple <laughs> in Mayapur. <laughs> okay, so people may, may say like that. Actually, it happened like that. Prabhupada was building the Bombay temple. Prabhupada was building temple in Juhu, needed money. And the devotee Bhakta Dasi said, Prabhupada, can we worship Ganesh? And so Prabhupada said, yes, you give one lakh dollars every month. You can do, but not less. All right. So, demigod worship. Someone can read. Impersonalist image. Imagine the various demigods to be forms of Lord. For example, the Mayavadis worship five demigods, Pancho Pasana. They do not actually believe in the form of Lord. But for the sake of worship, they imagine some form to be God. Generally, they imagine a form of Vishnu, a form of Shiva, and form of Ganesha, the sun god, and Durga. This is called Panchopasana. Mm -hmm. All right. So, people worship the demigods. It, it's in, often impersonalism. And they just, they think these forms of the demigods are just imaginary. And ultimately, there's only the oneness. 
And so their goal is to merge into the oneness like that. Let's talk a bit more about the demigod worship before we go on to impersonalism, right? What kind of people worship the demigods? Why do people worship demigods, first of all? Because they have material desires. Uh, they want quickly, quick results. Yes, right. That's the point. Why don't they worship Krishna? It will take long time. Yes. Right, will take long. Why does Krishna take longer time? Because he will give only what we deserve and not what we want. Mm. Yeah. Krishna will. He, he want to purify us. Right, right. Yes, Krishna will purify us. He likes to. He wants to purify us first. Right. That's the point. Very good. Right. And so people worship demigods. They, they, they think we'll get result quick, right? People are in the mode of passion or ignorance. So, does Krishna sanction the demigod worship? No, no, Maharaji. Really? Uh, Krishna, Krishna rather says that. Huh? Krishna rather says that whatever faith you have, so I maintain that faith. So. Even if you worship demigods, I would maintain your faith in the demigods. Yeah. And so in a way we can say in a way we can say that Krishna sanctions. So when somebody wants to worship the demigods, Krishna's in the heart of the person and he makes their faith strong. Yes. So that they can devote themselves yes. to that demigod. All right? Krishna fills Krishna. Yes. Krishna facilitates, Krishna facilitates the worship of the demigod. And when they're worshipping the demigod for some material result, does Krishna get, get involved with that? Who's giving the results when they worship the demigods to get some material result? Yes, Maharaj Krishna. Yes, Maharaj Krishna is involved because ultimately Krishna sanctions whatever they desire. Right. Krishna has to sanction whatever the demigods are giving. Benefits are given by Krishna, but they're given through the demigods. Without the sanction of Krishna, the demigods cannot do it. But, of course, people, they just worship the demigods. They don't worship Krishna. So the fruits that the demigods offer, they're actually coming from Krishna. It is indirect worship of Krishna, isn't it? Well, <laughs> not really, no. <laughs> that's, that's another thing. And what is, it, what is the destination of the people who worship the demigods? Yes, they'll stay in the material world. Where, where are they going to go? The they can go to the heavenly planets. Heavenly planets. They're going to go to... The same demigod. Right. They'll go to the planet of that demigod. Yes, they'll go to that planet of the demigod they were worshipping. They're devoted to a particular demigod. They'll go to that planet in the material world where that demigod lives. They'll stay there for some time and then come back. Hmm? But what about devotee of Krishna? They attain the abode of the Lord. Yes, they can go to the Lord's abode, right? So what kind of people worship the demigods? Less intelligent people. Yes, less intelligent. And what's the result of demigod worship? Yes, the results will be limited and temporary. They're not going to get the ultimate benefit. But if they worship, if we worship the Supreme Lord, then we can get the highest benefit. So some people say, 
Well, the demigods, they're also part of the body of the Supreme Lord. So I'm worshipping, when I worship the demigods, I'm also worshipping Krishna. Right? People will say like that. They'll say, demigods, they're part of the body of Krishna. And so when I worship the demigods, I'm worshipping part of the body of Krishna. So? But then one can but then one cannot satisfy all the ten gods. But we worship Krishna. Uh, by satisfying Krishna, we can worship. It's equal to satisfying all the ten gods at one go. Well, I'm just trying to satisfy the demigod I worship. I'm, uh, you know, he's a part of Krishna. I don't, you know, I know I can't. Can. Maharaj, it will be like watering, you know, one uh, leaf of the plant and the other leaf of the plant. So why not to, uh, you know, water the root of the plant? So all the leaves will be. Uh, nourished automatically. Yes, that's a better answer. Uh, Maharaj, Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj, so in Srimad Bhagavatam it is says that uh, the different limbs, which it, it's a material form of the Lord and which is temporary. So basically by worshipping the temporary, the temporary uh, Lord, we are not worshipping the personal feature of Lord. So the thing is we cannot uh, have the uh, Krishna realizes. Mm. Well, still one may think, one may say, you know, that, no, I'm, I'm worshipping Krishna, but through the demigods. I'm worshipping the demigods. They are part of the body of the Lord. So I'm worshipping the demigods. But if they are, are worshipping demigods for pure devotional service, demigod will direct them to Krishna. That is okay. Now, there is an example, there's an example of Bharat Maharaj. He worshipped the demigods, but he worshipped the demigods understanding that they were part of the body of the Supreme Lord. So when he was worshipping them, he was not worshipping the demigods to get any material benefit. Now, generally when people worship demigods, they want... They worship the demigods to get some result. They want something material. That's why these people are called Alpamedasaha. Alpamedasa, their brain is very small, less intelligent, Prabhupada says. Alpamedasaha. They have a small brain because they are worshipping for material benefit. So, we have to understand that you worship the Lord, you worship the demigods, it's not the same as worshipping Krishna. You can do it like that, just like I said, Bharat, Bharat Maharaj, he did it, he worshipped the demigods to get he, but he, when he was worshipping the demigods, he understood them to be part of the body of the Lord. We are also part of the body of the Lord. Right? Just like we give the example, when people feed, when you offer food, you have to know which part of the body to feed, right? When you give food to someone, you don't you don't put the food in their feet, you don't put the food in the, on the on their on their hand. You want to put it in their mouth. The food should go in the mouth. So different parts of the body have different functions. It's not all one. So people they they say, oh, we're worshiping the demigods. They're all parts of the body. It's all the same. But we should understand that it's not that all parts of the body are the same. Different functions for different parts of the body. You can give food to the body. Can you feed the body through the eyes or the ears? You have to, you have to put the food in the mouth. So the people worship the demigods and they say that parts of the universe parts of the universal body of Krishna and they think every demigod's like a god. They think he's also God. 
but the demigods are only a part of the Supreme Lord, tiny parts, right? Krishna is in their heart, the super soul is in their heart, in the demigods. So you get a different result. The Bharat Maharaj is the example when he worshipped the demigods, but he worshipped the demigods they were, as they were agents of Vishnu, not for material results. He didn't want any material results. He just worshipped them as being servants of Lord Vishnu. So if you worship the demigods as being servants of Vishnu, then it's all right. And you, and you worship them to get love of God. You don't worship them to get material benefits. We have to understand the difference. Is it clear? And people will say, you know, you can worship any god. They're all one, they're all the same. We worship the demigods, they, they say like that. And we talk, Pancho is there also. They worship the five gods. Ultimately, they're saying there's no god, there's only the oneness. They say these are just imagery. And so this demigod worship is it's a big thing. Of course, very common. And people don't understand it. And so this, this is a category of people who don't surrender. They worship the demigods. But there's another class of people who don't surrender. They're called impersonalists and they're described in text number 24. So you can look through the purport there. Just take a little time to go through the purport of text number 24 and see if you can pick out some of the er erroneous notions. What are some of the wrong notions of the impersonalists? given in text 24. Everyone got a book? Yes. You've got you've got some erroneous notion of the impersonalist. Did you pick out something? From text in the purport of text twenty four? Okay, that's one point. They consider that the Lord has no form, is without form. That's one thing, one erroneous notion. We have a form. How can you, how can you defeat that argument? How will you argue against it? You know, some, I, I may say, oh well, if God had a form, then he couldn't be God because I have a form and I know my form is so much misery, so much suffering, it gets old, it gets disease, and I have so many problems, my hair is falling out, my hair is all grey. God doesn't have a form like us, he has a transcendental form. Like we have a body and the soul, it's separate. But Krishna is whole soul, like he, he doesn't have a separate material body like us. But what kind of body does he have? Transcendental body, which is not perishable, it, uh, he doesn't take birth and uh, he himself says that those who knows my birth and death to be transcendental, uh, he achieves me and he knows me incomplete. 
Hare Krishna Maharaj, by knowing the Vedic literature uh, and the Nama Rupa Guna Leela, we can uh, understand the actual form of the Lord given by the great Acharyas. Yes, well, I was just discussing with the Madhiji, she was explaining the Lord has a transcendental form. And so I wanted to know more about that form of the Lord. Okay, yes, that's the point, right? Satchit Ananda. The Lord's form is Satchit Ananda. Eternity, knowledge and bliss, right? But the, the impersonalists say, no, they say the Supreme Absolute Truth is without form because they think, I have a form and so if, if the Absolute Truth has a form, then the Absolute Truth must be like me, must be limited. But we argue, no, there's the transcendental nature, there's a, the Lord has a transcendental form, form of transcendence, a form of satchit ananda, not a form of ignorance, misery and, and so many other bad things which are found in the material body. Okay, any other notions about the impersonalists? God has... Can you speak English? Uh, yes, uh, Maharaj, it is actually mm. Krishna born as a son of uh, Devaki Vasudev. Mm. They, they regard the Lord as an ordinary person. Ordinary person, yes. Rather, they think that he was just a powerful living entity. So maybe a bit a bit better than the ordinary people, but just a powerful, maybe just a Siddha uh, who had some mystic powers, that's it. Okay, so this is what right, yes, this will be the notion of the impersonalists. Right. They see Krishna as an ordinary person. Yes. So, how are you going to deal with that? How can you explain it's not ordinary? Karma, karma, I think quoting verses will not help you. It is, he is unborn, he is Raja. You can't just quote Shastra. It's not going to help you. Devotional service by devotional service. And when Krishna first appeared, he appeared in four handed form, which is not normal for any of us. Can we give the example of sun, like as the sun has the sun, you know, light, and same it has a, it is also a sun planet. In the same way, the Lord has its impersonal form, but he is Lord himself also. If we don't see the sun planet, you know, we see the light, we cannot say there is no sun planet. Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, Maharaj, uh, the, the impersonists, they, uh, mostly they discuss on the Vedic literatures. So we cannot understand Krishna by discussing on Vedic literature. We have to do the devotional service only. Then only we, are, we will be able to understand properly. Well, that kind of argument is not going to convince somebody. <laughs> You know, somebody, somebody may be a Vedantist, and as you say, they, they don't study our literature. They have their own literature. And you're going to tell them that you can't understand because you don't do devotional service. Are you going to defeat their argument? That's not going to defeat their argument, just talking to them like that. Maharaji, uh, there's a... Uh, Krishna has done, may, uh, performed many astonishing feats like when he was six days old, he uh, uh, killed uh, such a huge demon. So all the killing of the demon, lifting of the Govardhana, this is not a uh, feat which can be performed by any a ordinary person. So that proves that he was extraordinary. Okay, I think that's a better approach in presenting the nature of Lord Krishna, because we, as we're hearing, you know, the Lord Krishna takes birth, he comes as a cowherd boy, the son of Nanda and Yashoda. So how can we explain his transcendental nature 
and I think your argument is good, Prabhu, that you said he performs many wonderful feats. Right. He killed so many different demons as a little child and he picked up the Govardhan hill, performed many wonderful activities which are beyond human, beyond the ability of any normal person or even, even a great demigod, even they couldn't be, begin to achieve what Lord Krishna did. So explaining the nature of Lord Krishna's activities, how he could do so many these wonderful feats, which are beyond the imagination. And Maharaj many times like uh, to uh, his mother uh, showed that he showed in his mouth the whole, whole uh, cosmos. And then during the uh, war of uh, Mahabharata, he sold his uh, Virat, uh, Virat group and other places he sold uh, his, uh, his uh, Vishwaru. Okay. So all those things which further proves that he, he, he was the God, uh, Lord himself. All right. Thank you. Yes. These are some good arguments. Right? Okay, so we've got, there's a couple of good erroneous notions. First of all, that, uh, that the Lord has no form, and then the other one that, well, Lord has a form, but it's an ordinary form, he's just a material, an ordinary person like us. He takes birth, he has a mother and father, and like that. Is there anything else? Maharaj, he, he has given all the six opulences at different stages. And, and, and those opulences, which, which is uh, uh, to the perfection which anybody can like, he has shown his beauty, his wealth, his strength, his intelligence. Okay, but uh, are there any other notions of the impersonalists? Maharaj, there could be one. That the God is impersonal, but he has taken a form as person. So ultimately their notion is God is impersonal, but the impersonal has now taken a form. Yes, right. Yes, we had that. That, that. that ultimately he has no form, but he's taken a form. He's taken a material form, they think also. The form which is taken is material. So they understand like that. Unintelligent men, they think that I, Krishna speaking, that I was impersonal before and have now assumed this personality. Hmm. They're thinking ultimately, what is the Supreme? They think impersonalism is Supreme. Yes, the Brahman is the Supreme. They're thinking Krishna has come from the Brahman. I remember looking in a dictionary, I looked up the word Krishna and it said the eighth incarnation of Vishnu. Right? The, the, they said Krishna is an expansion of Vishnu. And who is Vishnu? Vishnu is the, the form of the impersonal Brahman. Now ultimately they think every, the, the Brahman is the supreme and Krishna came from the Brahman. So this is some of the notions of the impersonalists. Any, any other point? Okay, we'll go ahead. Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, yes. I came across two persons. One is a, one is a, can I mention the religion? Is it offensive? Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay, one person said that, uh, she told me, you want to go back to Godhead, but I just want to be in Nirvana. So, you know, she said that our goals are different. And one more person I met said that, I cannot identify with the forms of God. I prefer the formless. Uh -huh. like okay. So, so the, 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 when we see, when, when, I, when, when Guru Maharaj was mentioning about the Maya Ma Tantra Nana, uh -huh. so when we, talk, when we say Acharya, we are talking about our Vaishnav, Vaishnavism Acharya, but they got their own uh, uh, gurus with their own texts and all that. So, so what category are they in, these groups of people? The one who wants to be in Nirvana, uh, wants, to, wants to just be that inert, and the other one who says, cannot identify with uh, the form of God, 
But the one, the one who wants to be nirvana, generally nirvana, that's like Buddhists, you know, they want that state of nirvana. Yes, yes. That's like the, the sunyavada, the nirvana, the nothingness, right? So the, the, the Prabhupada's preach, Lord Chaitanya's teaching goes against uh, nirvasesha and sunyavada. The nirvasesha, nirvasesha, nirvana and sunyavada. So nir, nirvana, nirvasesha, that's often that's impersonalism. They want that nirvana also. That, that I, but some people, they want the sunyavada, the sunyavada, the nothingness. Buddha's teachings are that everything, nothing is real, everything is zero. And Shankaracharya, he's teaching everything is one. So that's nirvana. Right? Yes, so, thank you. So Lord Chaitanya's teaching is against both of these teachings. It defeats both impersonalism and voidism. Voidism, everything is zero, which is the Buddhist philosophy, and impersonalism, everything is one. Okay, going ahead, here's a ni nice quote from Prabhupada. Someone please read this quote. Small mudas are working hard only to become happy, and the big muda wants to become God. The small muda wants to become a minister or a president, and the big muda wants to become God. The disease is the same. I shall become the most powerful, but that is not possible. Only Krishna is the most powerful. Lecture on Bhagavad Gita 4.20, Bombay, 1974. Hare Krishna. Actually, the impersonalism, that's their idea, that they will become God. They want to become one with the Supreme. They think ultimately everything is one, so they think, I'm God. I'm God, and then they'll say, you're also God. That's what impersonalism is teaching. Ultimately, it's everything is one. And so I, you, God, we're all one. And so Prabhupada explains here, there's small mudhas and the big mudha. The small mudha wants to become the president and the big mudha wants to become God. The same disease. Right? Only Krishna is actually the most powerful. Okay, then, then Krishna goes ahead then. He asks like, uh, is, ev any, is everyone able, to, who's, who's able to actually see Krishna? In, uh, impersonalists, they're detached from matter, right? They're not attached to matter, they're not interested in the material world. So they're also transcendentalists. So do they get to see Krishna? What do you say? Does the impersonalist get to see Krishna? No, not covered sense. Huh? Not covered sense. Yeah, they don't get to see. Krishna is saying here, he's saying, Naham Prakasha Sarvashya, Yoga Maya Samavrit. Mudu Yam, Mudu Yam, right? He said, I'm never manifested a foolish. The mudas, the, the unintelligent. I am never manifest to the foolish and the unintelligent. I am covered by my internal potency. The yoga maya. Yoga maya is Krishna's internal potency. Yoga maya samavrata. Nabhijanati. Right? Mudoyama nabhijanati. The unborn, they do not know. Krishna is Abhijan, he never takes birth. And he's, he's mam ajam avyayam. He, mam ajam avya. he's unborn and infallible. But this foolish, less intelligent, they don't get to see Krishna. Krishna doesn't show himself to everyone. Who does he show himself to? Surrenders, Lord, that's He shows himself to those who have love, 
of Krishna. All right, Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, only one qualification to see God, premanjana charita bhakti vilochanena. When your eyes are covered with love of God, then you will see Krishna. You won't see Krishna without love of God. So we have to develop that love for Krishna. But for these people, foolish, unintelligent, we're saying, you know, these people who surrender to other, surrender to demigods and impersonalism, these are all the foolish and unintelligent. So Krishna doesn't show himself to these people. And they cannot see Krishna, they cannot understand Krishna. Krishna's covered, right? Krishna covers himself from them. So they can't see Krishna, but does that mean Krishna is also covered? Is Krishna also covered? No, Maharaj, Krishna is always there. Krishna sees everything. You can see everything which is taking place, right? The next verse describes Oh, the next verse describes, I'll read it to you, I, I didn't put it on the slide. Arjuna, O oh Arjuna, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, I know everything that has happened in the past, all that is happening in the present, and all things that are yet to come. I also know all living entities, but me, no one knows. Nobody knows Krishna, right? Hardly anyone knows Krishna. But Krishna knows everything. He's, he knows everything going on. So we can be put into maya and ignorance, but Krishna is never put into maya. Krishna is never covered. He knows everything. Okay, so then Krishna is going on to describe about how the living entities get covered by maya. And this, this shows here, this verse, right? How do, the, how do the living entities get put into maya? Anybody? By identifying with By doing things of maya. By Lord, external potency that is maya. It's mentioned here, Icha and Dvesha. Icha and Dvesha. What's that? Icha and Dvesha? Desire and hatred. Yes, desire and hate. Desire for what? Material. What, per what particular desire? What are we desiring? What kind of... We want to be God. Prabhupada was just saying, like, little mudas and big mudas. We, they all want to be the God, they want to be the Supreme. And who do we hate? Who do we hate? Dvesha is also envy. Who are we envious of? The Lord. Yes, the Lord. right. We have, we have the desire to be God and we are envious of Him. So all living entities are born into delusion, bewildered by the dualities which come from desire and hate. Desire, we want to get something. And dwesha, we want to give up something. Right? Have you experienced that? Sometimes you want something very bad and then sometimes you get you want to get rid of it. Oh I yeah. sometimes you have a friend, oh your friend is very, very dear to you. Then something goes wrong and then you never want to see them again and you just, oh, I just want to keep away from that person. So, Icha and Dvesha, desire and hate. This is the problem. This is how we, be, how we get into Maya. We become covered by Maya because of this desire and hate. And the, it says, all living entities are born into delusion. Is, is that everyone? Not everyone. There's a few souls. 
there are a few souls, special souls, who are able to transcend that. But most people, they're in that consciousness, that delusion, the delusion, this is mine, this belongs to me, this is for my property, this is my, for my enjoyment. They cannot understand Krishna. So you can see how difficult it is to come to that platform. We were talking about the surrendered devotee to become a jnani. The jnani, they, they don't get caught into that trap. They don't get fooled into that kind of illusion, happiness and distress, male and female. No, they transcend all that. So, is anybody able to become a devotee? Is anybody able to overcome illusion? Here, text 28 describes who can become actually free of illusion. What's the qualification? What do you have to do? Yes, we should have acted piously in previous lives and in this life. And also sinful actions finished and freed from the dualities of delusion. We were speaking just now about the delusion. And the delusion, this is mine, this is my property, it's all for my enjoyment. This kind of delusion. So these are, these kind of people, they engage themselves in my service with determination. Mentioned here, Dridhavrat. Dridhavrat. We'll meet that word, Dridhavrat means, what does it mean? Someone who is in determination. Right. It's mentioned again in the ninth chapter. Do any, any of you know that verse where it's mentioned? Dridavra, determination. Satatam kirtayantumam. Right. Always chanting my glories, endeavoring with great determination. These souls perpetually worship me. Krishna is describing in the ninth chapter about Mahatmas. So here, Lord Krishna is describing the qualification to engage in his service with determination. We have to have acted piously in previous lives and in this life. So, it, do you have that qualification? Have you all acted piously in your previous lives and in this life? Have you got that punya karma? You don't, you can't remember. You don't remember, eh? Punya karma. What kind, where, what is that punya karma na? Where do we get it? How do we get it? Association of devotees. Right. Listening to Maharaj. We get punya karma. What, how do we attract the devotee? One way you attract the devotee is by doing punya karma. If you do some pious activity, if the devotee sees somebody doing punya karma, they think, oh, this is a very pious person, he's a good person, you know. We think he's a good, maybe we should preach to him. We should tell him about Krishna consciousness because he's got some punya. Now people's punya, often it's just material. You know, they do some material, pious activity, help the, help the poor people, feed the sick. You know, they're good candidates for Krishna consciousness. They, but they don't, they don't have that real punya karma. 
devotee came to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, but did I become a devotee because my pious activities, my previous lives? What did Prabhupada say? I created your pious Yes. Prabhupada laughed. He said, I, I am creating your pious activity. Right? That's the point. That by us, by us coming to Krishna consciousness, we attract the attention of the devotees and they help us to create that punya karma. We ask you, what things are stopping us from seeing Krishna? How to overcome them? Take a couple of minutes, just write down some things. Or can you think of anything at the top of your head? Anything it's comes in immediately to mind? It's a material attachment, it's a, it's a, uh, a love for family. It's a, we think that uh, without me, nothing is going to uh, work. So uh, we think that everything is dependent on me. Mm -hmm. Okay, that feeling of being unique. Yeah, feeling of being very important to others and it, without you the family will never survive. Maharaj, uh, the, we are not able to uh, surrender personally, 100% surrender, have the insecurity. Like, Why not? Why are you not able to surrender? Maharaj, due to our anarthas maybe, like our plus greed, anger, Envy, illusion. Lust, greed, anger. Well, how do we overcome it? How do we overcome that? You should know. We try to we should we should try to engage all these propensities to Krishna service. Yes. How do we conquer lust? You've studied that, right? You studied the Bhagavad Gita. By doctoring our love for Using our senses to devotional service to Krishna. Mm -hmm. What did Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita to conquer lust? That's not Bhagavad Gita. Quote Bhagavad Gita. What did Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita? Surrender unto me to obey Steady intelligence. Steady intelligence. Steady intelligence. Yes, that was mentioned. And also, regulate, knowledge. regulating the senses. No, that's sixth chapter. That's another thing. That's controlling the mind. You had said, like, uh, we will not be satisfied. Sex, like uh, sex and lust, we will not get satisfied. How much we do? Krishna. It's like itching. The more you itch, the itch will increase. Krishna doesn't talk about that. When conquering lust, he gives it. He tells us how we can conquer lust. He said, regulating the regulating the senses. Senses, the Yes, and cultivating the higher intelligence. Cultivating spiritual knowledge will help us to conquer over lust. So it's very important for us to study these books and hear this knowledge. Now you already studied that before. This is there in the, 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 it's, it's a, the third chapter, right? Lust, the all-devouring sinful enemy, burns like fire, never satisfied. So Krishna tells us how to conquer it. You can read again that section of the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna tells us where the lust is and how to conquer it. He says by regulating the senses and cultivating spiritual intelligence. We can, armed with knowledge, stand and fight, Krishna says. Last words. Okay. 
chapter 3, last one. Yes, at the end of chapter 3, section on lust. Okay, stopping us. This is, these things are stopping us from seeing Krishna. And the, and the, one th problem is we, we're more interested to see so many other things than to see Krishna. We don't have a very strong desire to want to see Krishna. That's one of the problems. And we have to develop that desire. We should become very eager to want to see Krishna. When will Krishna come? When will I see Krishna? We should be thinking like that. So we try. Uh, I have a question. Can I ask? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, how do we know that uh, uh, are we being neglectful of the duty or we are being surrendered? Like we are surrendered to Krishna because it's very thin line of difference. One may say that I know Krishna will do everything for me. And one may not do his duties. Well, then that's, that's not serving Krishna. If you're, you're saying Krishna will do everything for me, that's not the mood of a devotee. The devotee thinks Krishna has already given me so much. I don't want to just take all the time from Krishna. I should give to Krishna. I should offer to Krishna. Krishna is giving us so much already. And you want to keep, take more from Krishna. That's not good. So, uh, Maharaj, I mean, uh, these material duties when we do, so we may think that this is my family and Krishna has given us children and, you know, Krishna has given us a devotee husband, some kind of, these kind of things, that there is a thin line of difference. We can either be neglectful of our duties or we can surrender to Krishna and look at them as devotees. So, how do we uh, do our duties in this consciousness? So how do we know that we are, are we neglecting our duties or are we being surrendered to Krishna? Well, what, what is surrender to Krishna? We have to do our sadhana, we have to chant, we, we have to worship Krishna and read the books about Krishna. Are you doing that? If you're doing that, that's surrendering to Krishna, right? You read the books, you chant. Worship Krishna, you offer your food to Krishna, that is, that is your duty. We should know the process of Krishna consciousness. We have to chant and hear and associate with, with, with devotees. All right? Thank you, Maharaj. And Try to give your family also Krishna consciousness too. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Maharaj, uh, could you a little elaborate this uh, surrender part? How to surrender hundred percent? Like I will give my example. Like uh, now I am young and my other friends they are everyone also studying and they are doing their academics. Now they are pursuing their career and I came to my and I feel I want to stay here, I don't want to go anywhere in some lot. And sometimes that insecurity comes, what will happen to you later? And other people you are together, they will be on good post or they will have good career and like this kind of things comes in mind. And I, internally the voice comes, no, you should not leave. You're going to Maya, you leave Maya. Yes, well. Do you mean, like, you might want to become a full-time devotee? Yes, like, at least stay in the home and serve in the school, not to go out. Yes, we have to have faith in what we're doing, that I'm doing the right thing, that this, you give this one life to Krishna. We've already tried to enjoy material life so many other lives before. So many other lives we had without Krishna. Give this one life to Krishna, Prabhupada taught us. He said, just give this one life to Krishna. He said, we already tried so many other times, in so many ways, in so many places, in so many different bodies. We tried to enjoy the material world without Krishna. Now, just give this one life to Krishna. So make that commitment that I'm going to give this one life to Krishna. No matter what happens, I'm going to give it to Krishna. I'm going to 
stay in Krishna consciousness, no matter what happens. My friends may go away, they may all leave me, it doesn't matter, I'm not going to give up Krishna consciousness. We should have that kind of conviction. Thank you, Maharaj. This one life, this is for Krishna. Of course, we'll do other, we have to do other things. You have to maybe have a family, you have a job and so on like that. But the, the essential part is Krishna. You're going to keep your consciousness of Krishna. Okay. Uh, do we want to go on or do, do we want to stop? Is it okay to go over time? Are any of you pushed on time? Fine, Maharaj, we can continue. We can continue? Okay, someone can read this. God consciousness is not cheap thing. Yesham te atagatam papam jnanam punya karmam karmanam. One who is completely free from all contamination of material moods, antagatam papam, sinful activities, te dev, devanagam moha. Nirmukta Bhajate Maam can, can stick to the principle of devotional service. Otherwise, if he is not free from the contamination of sinful life, he may make a show of devotion, but that is not actual devotion. Bhaktya Bhasha, that is called Bhakti Bhasha. Bhaktya Bhasha, that means a shadow of devotion, not real devotion, right? So Prabhupada is explaining this verse to us, right? Isham twantagatam papam jananam punya karmana te danva moha nirmukta bhajanti mam Right? He said unless we have that real devotion, unless we're free of the contamination of sinful life, we may pretend, we make a show of devotion, but it's not real, it's not pure devotion, it's bhaktiya bhas, or you could say mixed devotion. Here Prabhupada says it's a shadow of devotion. So, uh, yes? So, Krishna says in the 18th chapter, Sarva Dharman Parityajya Mamekam Sharanam Vaja Aham Tvam Sarva Papya Bhyo Those who approach me, who, who surrender me, surrender to me, I will take out all the sins. So, but this particular word says, those who are sinless, they only can come to do the service to Krishna. So how do we reconcile these two? Mm -hmm. Well, we have to understand that to surrender to Krishna, that you're going to, Krishna said, give up all your dharmas, all these dharmas, you see, you're not going to be able to do that so easily, unless you're free of sin. Sarva dharma parigajna mamikam sharanam braja. To take shelter of Krishna and to give up all of these other things, all the other attachments that we have. It's not an easy thing. Krishna, Krishna said, I will protect you, I will free you from all sinful reactions. Because sinful reactions in the sense that you've given up these other dharmas. So Arjuna may be worried or we may be worried if I give up these other things, and maybe I'll get reactions. But Krishna says, no, you give up these, these other material dharmas, I will protect you from the reactions. Not that it will protect us from sin. If we do, we're actually doing something sin, out, you know, just out and against the religious principles. But this is a different kind of sin. So here we're talking about the contamination of sinful life. But there, in that verse in the 18th chapter, Krishna is talking about giving up these different dharmas, the sinful reactions which may come due to giving up these other dharmas. But here uh, we're talking about the contamination of sinful life. It's a, a, a different level of sin. So, yeah, different, different level, Krishna is talking on a different level. Your 18th chapter, Krishna is at the conclusion of his teachings. 
He's telling Arjuna to surrender, take shelter of him. Yeah, but how can we, how can we get rid of simple reactions and simple life only by, only by serving Krishna and only by performing devotional service, right, Maharaj? That is the only way to clear the simple reactions. Yes, right, but. <laughs> to surrender to Krishna, that it's not so easy thing. As Krishna said, as you surrender, I reward you accordingly. So we surrender a bit, but to actually fully surrender. And so we're trying, we're trying, we're on, as Prabhupada is saying here, God consciousness, God consciousness is not a cheap thing. It's going to take some time. You have to, you will have to be persistent. We have to really want to achieve it. And there will be tests, there will be challenges. Lord Buddha was tested. Jesus Christ was tested. We will also be tested. We have to be persistent. We have to really want. Right? So this surrender, not so easy thing. We surrender portion, gradually surrender a bit more, a bit more. Right? So it's ongoing, an ongoing Maharaj, process. Yes. One question, Maharaj. Ah. Uh, so when we are in this process of trying, are we actually putting all the bhaktivasa? Well, yes, you could say like that, because you know, there's a difference. You know, pure devotion and mixed devotion. You know, we talk about mixed devotion. Uh, that what is pure devotion? How is it, dis you know, that you're, you, uh, you have no desire at all for fruit of result and no desire for liberation. That is pure devotion. You have no material desires. You know, we do have some material desires. Of course, we may say, well, it's in relation to my devotional service. Hmm. But, yeah, I mean, we're, we're trying to become devotees. Prabhupada never said we were doing bhakti bhas. He uses it here, but he, you know, said, you're all devotees. But he's bringing it up here, he said that is not, if you make a show of devotion, if you just simply make a show of devotion, that making a show of devotion means it's not genuine devotion, but it's just imitation. So that's, we're not doing that. We're not doing, so we're not doing bhakti bhas. Our devotion may be mixed, we have some material desires, but we're not bhakti bhas. Because bhakti bhas, they make a show of devotion, means their devotion is not genuine. Now, I don't think you're doing that. I don't think any of us are doing that. I think we're all genuine, but our devotion may be mixed, that we still have some material attachments, material desires. Is that better? Ma Maharaj? Yeah? Ah, yes, Maharaj. I understand. Yeah? Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Guru Maharaj, may I ask a question? Yes. Guru Maharaj, why is it some of our own Hare Krishna devotees, they talk sometimes in a discouraging way, they tell us, Mataji, there are so many more lifetimes, it's all right, we cannot perfect it now, don't kill yourself, we try again, we, are, we, we will take a long time to go back to Godhead. I don't know why they're talking like that. When, when, when I've heard time and again that we must make it in this lifetime, as Maharaj, uh, Guru Maharaj just mentioned just now, that uh, I'm going to give this one life for Krishna because I've enjoyed so much already in the past. Guru Maharaj, why our devotees don't have this conception? They don't know about this. They're thinking of many, a lot of time to do this. Krishna consciousness. Well, there are, dif you. there are different devotees. Not every devotee says like that. You know, there are different devotees. You have to just mix. You have to understand there are different devotees with different moods and you have to decide who you're going to hear from and who you're going to keep away from. So you just have to understand that, that there are different people, different strokes for different folks. 
So, you say, okay, that's your thinking, but it's not mine. Just tell them. Okay, we'll go ahead. Let's see where we are. Oh, <laughs> okay, someone can read this for us. Srila Bhakti Vinodha Thakur explains this point. Is this Bhagya fortune the result of an accident or something else? In the scriptures, devotion, service and pious activity are considered fortunate. Pious activities can be divided into three categories. Pious activities that awaken one's dormant Krishna consciousness are called uh, Bhakti Unmukhi Sukriti. Pious activities that bestow material opulence are called Bhogon Mukhi Sukriti and pious activities that enable the living entity to merge into the existence of the Supreme are called Mokshon Mukhi Sukriti. These last two awards of pious activity are not actually fortunate. Okay, so this is describing different kinds of pious activities. Punya karma, different categories. What we want is this Bhakti Unmukhi Sukriti. The pious activities which give us devotional service. But, you know, you d maybe you give charity, you give, for the, you give blood or you give charity for the old people's home or the children's school or something. You know, that's, that's just bogan muki sukriti. It's not going to get you devotional service. And if you give for the Mayavadis, you give for the Vedanta society or something, that's Mokshun Mukhi Sukriti. That will help you to merge into the Supreme. But when you give for a devotee, you give something for Krishna consciousness, then you get Bhakti and Mukhi Sukriti. That's what we really want. Right? So that's the idea. Go ahead, keep reading Prabhu. Okay, Prabhu. Pious activities are fortunate when they help one become Krishna conscious. The good fortune of Bhakti and Mukhi is attainable only when one comes in contact with the devotee. By associating with the devotee, willingly or un unwillingly, one advances in devotional service and thus one's dormant Krishna consciousness is awakened. Okay, so this is the important part here. All right, our pious activities. They will help, when they help us become Krishna conscious, then they're actually good. The good fortune comes when we come in contact with a devotee. And from the devotee, then we get, we learn about devotional service. So by doing pious activities, you may attract a devotee. And then the devotee will teach us about Krishna consciousness. Okay, here's the summary of the chapter. Chapter 7 began, Knowing Krishna in full by hearing about Him. And then we heard about how Krishna is the source of everything. There's no truth superior to me, everything rests on me, perils are strung on a thread. And then we heard how Krishna is in everything, the sound and ether, the light of the sun and the moon, and, but everything's affected by three modes, but Krishna's not. But if we surrender to Krishna, we can overcome the modes of nature. And then we heard about the pious people who surrender and the impious people who never surrender. And then we heard about people who surrender to demigods and impersonalists. And then we're, finally we're hearing about the effect of maya, the bewilderment of the living entity. Freedom from freedom. We get freedom from maya by knowledge of Krishna. Okay, so that's the summary of the chapter, the different divisions there, several different sections. A final quote from Srila Prabhupada, someone like to read? Many subjects have been discussed in this chapter. The man in distress, the inquisitive man, the man in want of material necessities, knowledge of Brahman, knowledge of Paramatma, liberation from birth, death and diseases, and worship of the Supreme Lord. However, he who is actually elevated in Krishna consciousness does not care for the different processes. 
he simply directly engages himself in activities of Krishna consciousness and thereby factually attains his constitutional position as an eternal servitor of Lord Krishna. In such a situation, he takes pleasure in hearing and glorifying the Supreme Lord in pure devotional service. He is convinced that by his doing so, all his objectives will be fulfilled. This, de this determined faith is called Dhridabrata. And it is the beginning of Bhakti Yoga or Transcendental Loving Service. That is the verdict of all scriptures. This seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is the substance of that con conviction. Bhagavad Gita 7.34. All right. Okay, so thank you very much. Any final questions? Anyone? No? Okay, so I'll see you next week. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. So, Thank you Maharaj Hare Krishna. So when, when, when we are going to get an open book question? Open book question next week. Thank you Maharaj. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare